shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters Podcast. This is your host, Christopher, here, as always, with my good friend, Tom. Howdy! <laughs> How are you, Tom? How you doing? Not too bad. It's really hot here. <laughs> yes, it's uh, very hot um, all over, mm-hmm. I think. It's a good day to just uh, be inside and do podcasts, I think. Indeed. <laughs> Air conditioning, it's- churning away, talking to you, it's a good deal. Yeah, as as much as it's a great time to sit inside and watch movies and stuff, <laughs> I haven't done all that much in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, no, I haven't had much going on either. Uh, I mean, we were in birthday and Father's Day season, um, lots of things going on at work. So. Nope, understood. I mean, I did manage to watch um, a few things, but that was actually closer to the last time we recorded than now. Okay. Um just flipping around over on uh, Amazon, I found something called The 50 Worst Movies Ever Made <laughs> from 2004. Of which I'm just, sure you could refute almost all of them. <laughs> no, no, I no. actually couldn't refute almost all of them, but I did come across several I had never heard of. Oh, yeah? So I, of course, had to go and try to watch of some more. Of course. Uh, one I had never heard of, it was The Great Alligator from 1979. Can't say I heard of that one either. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, there's a reason that is not a good. I mean, out of the uh, kind of nature run amuck films, not one of the better for, uh, outings. And one I had heard of, but I don't, I'd only seen Rift, unlike Mystery Science Theater, was the intra- incredibly strange creatures who stopped living and became mixed up zombies. Yeah, I saw that you had watched that again without the without the uh, mystery science theater. Yes, exactly. I watched it unriffed, and it's not that that film is necessarily like awful. It's just a little bit of all over the place. It's it's kind of indescribable. <laughs> well, and it has a it has elements in it that are just kind of like why. Yeah, there's entire musical numbers. Yeah, the like the dance sequences, which uh, again Misty uh, made absolute fun of during during that. They're they're just kind of awkward, weird, and you can, why? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's definitely uh, we need to make we need to pad it out to like seventy minutes. <laughs> the actual horror part of our story, we've only got about forty minutes of story. What do we do? <laughs> I know song and dance numbers. <laughs> well, and then of course that that was also the film that uh, launched a recurring um, bumper character uh, on Mystery Science Theater, the the Ortega guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also another strange sort of what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just... in the film, but he, he didn't really have much of a point other than to just look terrible. Weirdly, I found that the 50 worst movies, not one single mention of Manos, The Hands of Fate, really? or Plan 9 from Outer Space. Literally the movies that define what bad is? Yeah. <laughs> didn't make the they, list? Ed, there was a few Ed Wood entries okay. in, the, uh, in the list, but not Plan 9 one. wasn't there. And yeah, no mention of Manos. I'm like, that shocks me (laughs) i actually kind of wonder if at this stage in the game and especially since um like riff tracks and mystery science theater have done them have elevated them to a cult-like status that maybe they don't quite fit in bad cinema anymore that is a distinct possibility like they they've achieved a level of entertainment value despite their lack of quality as a film if they've still become a thing that people kind of cherish and and watch just to just to be amused by its terribleness 
Yeah, maybe. That's a very good point. I, I, I think you're onto something there. It actually begs the question, like, and, and think of it. There are plenty of movies over history that have completely flat out bombed. Critics absolutely hate them. But when there's a specific audience that latches onto them, they gain a life of their own and they become things that people follow. Um, and even if it was not great to begin with, the fact that it is entertaining and b- makes an audience, now it does, you can't call it bad necessarily at this stage. <laughs> but uh, yes, that is, that is really all I've uh, done of note. Nothing really else uh, significant. Uh, I did actually think of something that we didn't even discuss pre-show. Um, my son has become enamored with Dune. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To the point he has actually even taken up reading the books. So, Oh, wow. I think you might have mentioned this to me. It might have been off mic last time. It, maybe. Um, but because of that, we, we did get a little time. Um, we had already watched the part one of the current iteration of the film. Um, and then we watched the part two, like, almost two weeks ago. Um, which, again shot very well acted very well but i don't know it it, not very exciting Uh, it comes off really kind of long and kind of humdrum uh so that part's a little disappointing and and it i know that there's a heavy religious overtone to dune it literally is what it's about it's about a messiah so I, i i get that but I don't know, the way that it was doing it, it was trying to give it a very, since it's Dune, they were going with an almost very Middle Eastern vibe to the Fremen uh, characters on Dune, right down to the way they would pray and and areas that look like mosques. And I, I don't know, it felt, I don't know, it felt pandering almost. To counter that, um, a friend found us a copy of the three-hour-long um, David Lynch film. My son and I watched that, which uh, was kind of really fun because, uh, granted, altogether, you're about five hours in between part one and part two of the current versions. So the David Lynch at three hours feels like a budget. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets way more backstory to the the universe to which they're in than the the current iteration does so he got a little bit more into that but because it's three hours and because it's such a big story it all feels very rushed uh even at three hours so he he was kind of like so you like this one better huh (laughs) and like i think a minute more for the music from toto than i am anything else yeah, I remember the uh, longer version has the what? Yeah, you actually need it. The the really good sort of uh, prologue. Pro, the prologue, you get a little bit of a primer about what the universe is, what makes it up, an explanation of all the planets and the different houses and yeah, the various characters, the guilds. Uh, it actually yes. mentioned all the guilds and the the uh, current iteration doesn't mention any of that like. They talk about Bene Gesserits, which is a big thrust of the film, but they didn't mention the Spacing Guild at all, which is also supposed to be a big part of the thrust. So it was it was kind of interesting uh, watching them both together. And then, of all things, I caught an interview on NPR where they were interviewing David Lynch, um, and they were de- interviewing him about some current things going on. But one of the questions that they ask him, and they do it, they did this thing where they just draw questions from cards kind of thing. So he and the interviewer don't know what's about to be asked. And Mm -hmm. he picks one, uh, and it basically, like, uh, uh, tell me about a disappointment in your career. (laughs) He he picked Dune, but he picked Dune for a reason, uh, which I thought was interesting. He's like... My one mistake with Dune was that I did not get um, Final Cut. Mm-hmm. And he's like, that would have been such a different movie if I had been allowed to make all of it the way that I wanted to make it. And I'm like, which begs the question, what 
would you have changed? So, <laughs> yeah, really. So, uh, which I'd be intrigued by because uh, I actually, for the most part, still kind of enjoy the '80s one more than the current. It's just fun watching my son get enamored with this stuff, and I'm like, "This is the one." Okay. <laughs> no, that's cool. Yes. Uh, you're t- talking about Lynch and his, you know, Dune and wishing he had final cut and everything. It reminds me of. Um, just listen to a podcast, um, Verbal Diorama. Okay. And she was talking about Star Trek, the motion picture. Okay. And she was talking about the backstory and all the the fact that it ever made it to screen is amazing because of all the uh, production issues and the behind the scenes, you know, head butting and everything. And director Robert Wise um, literally carried the final print it like just came out and it was like still wet and took it to, to the premiere kind of thing. That's how to the wire this thing was. Wow. So it was years later. He's not even, he wasn't even like a Star Trek fan, but he was just so disappointed in that final product that went to the theaters. Yeah. He was the one that ended up going to the studios years later and saying, would you let me <laughs> do a director's cut? <laughs> <laughs> So I can make this movie the way, or at least closer to the way that I think it should be. Right. And that's where we got that big director's cut that just that came out just a few years before Robert Wise passed away. So we got really lucky on that because that director's cut takes a mediocre film and it takes it up for me to be one of the best Star Trek films. Yeah, no, uh, the, that 4K director's cut is absolutely, it's both beautiful and it, and, and I already kind of dug the story, but it, it it elevated it rather quite a bit. Well, since neither of us have anything else really exciting, we'll go ahead and take a break. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast. And when we get back, we're going to travel back to 2018 to talk about Hotel Artemis. <laughs> Hi, I'm your host, Terry J. Amon. Remember that show you loved in the mid-aughts? I do too, but time isn't always so kind. I've run across some hits and serious misses cataloging media collections stretching back decades, and I do remember them, fondly and not, in Video Fuzzy, my blog-affiliated podcast dedicated to media, commentary, and nostalgia. That's Video Fuzzy, wherever you get podcasts. The most violent riot in California history. Three minutes. Open the ball now! Oh, that's real nice. You don't want it? No, I really do. Uh, Hit the ground now! I need to make a call. Hello. How can I help? Easy, fellas. Everybody's gonna get fixed up. Now verify your memberships, and we're off to the races. The Artemis is a secret hospital for criminals. I thought you were done with all this. I got out, but you know how it goes. You're never out. Not up here. I thought this place was a mess. We've been here for 22 years. This hospital was built on two things. Trust. And rules. You see that badge? That means I'm a healthcare professional. You're an arms dealer, right? Don't push my buttons. Don't you do that. I'm a professional, but this woman, she's a business. If you knew what she could do to you with just that cup of coffee. You're lucky this place has rules. The Artemis isn't safe for us, because it is. It's a portable vault. Worth about 18 million. Wolf King's probably going to want those back. Okay, this is a real problem. It's here. Open the gate. That's against the rules. Rules? Is that the rule breakers? Honey, where would you be? You got like a plan. You're my brother. I love you. 3D printing complete. I got the next best thing. I got a gun. I guess my ballroom days are over, baby. Showtime. There's a war zone up here. Am I gonna make it out of here? We can do it together. This is what I do. 
visiting hours are never. Busy night at the Artemis. You know, you might want to buy some scented candles or something, because it smells like somebody died in here. They did. Hotel Artemis, as I said, it was from 2018. It stars Jodie Foster, Sterling K. Brown, Sophia Botella, Charlie Day, Dave Batista, Jeff Goldblum, and Zachary Quinto. In the near future of 2028, the Hotel Artemis is a secret emergency room for the underworld run by the nurse and her orderly Everest. Taking advantage of a huge riot in L.A., a crook named Sherman and his brother try to rob a bank. When things go south, they grab what they can from some hostages and make a break for it. They run into a riot squad in an ensuing shootout. Most of Sherman's team is killed, and his brother, Lev, and another crook are badly wounded. Making their way to the hotel, Sherman and Lev are checked in as members, leaving the third member to be escorted out by the very large orderly, Everest. Now going only by their room names, Waikiki and Honolulu follow the strictly enforced rules of the hotel, including no weapons and no killing of other members. The nurse starts to patch Honolulu up, but things don't look good. Things get more complicated when the riot draws nearer and the owner of the hotel, the Wolf King, has been wounded and is, and is on his way to the hotel while another patient of the Artemis, uh, niece, a professional assassin, an acquaintance to Waikiki, has her own dark plans to break one of the cardinal rules of the hotel. But she isn't the only one willing to do so. And as, and as it has been proven many times before, without rules, there is only chaos. This was a first time watch for me, as I said in the last episode. It's been on my list for a while. Yeah, It's one of those things that it pops up in the, you know, you might like and that sort of thing. It's probably on my watch list on like three different services. <laughs> I never, I had not gotten around to it yet, so it was very cool finally getting to this thing. So what'd you think? I thought it was a good little action flick. This is one that I had seen in the theater. Um, oh, okay, cool. And I remember walking away from it not caring for it a whole lot. And that was then... And I think a big p part of that is um, I, I have no documentation to back this up other than other people had the same idea, is this was also in the same era as the John Wick films. And it was at least suggested by some that this had some loose connection to that. Uh, so like John Wick has the Hotel Continental, um, which is the secret place that all the criminals go to and they vow not to do anything to each other uh, and, and all that. Um, so it had that kind of vibe to it. And I don't know why, but because I thought this was supposed to be in that world and then it didn't quite fit, I guess I came away a little disappointed. Mm, but this gotcha. rewatch kind of reinvigorated it for me and I, I cut the strings from that perception and just watched it again and, and found I was actually really entertained by it this time. It has but one flaw for me. It just kind of rushes to the end at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe a little we, bit. We get this nice slow burn. We're kind of given little hit, hit tips at uh, what's going on in each of the characters' lives. Um, you're working toward the culmination uh, of the, the Wolf King coming as if almost everybody knows that he is uh, at least the niece character is expecting that that is part of why she's there uh, but yeah by the time we get to the part where he actually is in the hotel bing bang boom we're done <laughs> like <laughs> holy crap what just happened it's not like a groundbreaking action no. film taken apart beat all the pieces or nothing terribly original no there's a lot of derivative content here it still carries itself along pretty well and it's got some decent action films it's got a little bit of um it's got a little bit of angst and everything mm -hmm. with the uh, with the main uh, uh, waikiki and then and then you know and it's got a little bit of uh, humor and comedy between niece and uh, i don't i forget those room name charlie day's character he was Acapulco. I, I like that uh, Waikiki and Nice knew each other, and Acapulco was like, "What are you trying to? You trying to protect your girlfriend?" He's like, 
Pr- protect her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that whole that whole scene while they're in the common room. And, yes. And, yeah, and Acapulco's trying to hit on Nice, and, and he he just shows up, and he, he, Acapulco's getting all 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 butch in front in front of a guy that he has no prayer of fighting and winning against, and the guy doesn't even want anything to do with it. The whole notion is just. Oh, you think I'm the threat? <laughs> you, you go ahead and have at that. Uh, let me know how that goes for you. <laughs> Love that vibe. Obviously, you know the star of the film, and I think it, she is the star of the film. Is Jodie Foster? She's amazing in this. Yeah, actually, I thought so too. Uh, um, and we'll get into some more of that later. But uh, um, no, she uh, her presence in there, uh, the the a- aging that they did for her too, and and how she carried herself as what was obviously she's a drug user at this stage. Uh, she's definitely deeply, deeply depressed, um, and that she's just kind of sunk herself into this job um as the way to avoid the rest of the world to the literal point she won't leave the building Mm -hmm. (laughs) and no she was just absolutely amazing and the way she that's where some of the really good fun stuff comes in is of course every criminal coming to the establishment is coming in hot (laughs) and how you choose to approach her while you're coming in hot may may end your stay very quickly (laughs) i i want a prequel uh tv series with the nurse and the uh the orderly (laughs) jodie foster and uh dave batista in this are so good together that's that's why i watched this film and that's why i enjoyed this film i thought they were fantastic together and it's like I I want this story. I want more of these two. No, absolutely, because Dave was amazing in this, um, and, and he got some of the best lines too, uh, especially the his little running gag with, "Do you do you see this badge? This means I'm a healthcare worker." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's the biggest dude in the place. <laughs> oh, he's enormous. Yeah. This is honestly the only thing I've seen outside of the. Uh, Guardians. Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay. Uh, with Dave Batista. No, I've seen him in some other stuff. He, he's he he's got some chops. Uh, I'd like to see him get into some more serious roles. I think he may be hindered by the by just his sheer size. Well, yeah. You, and his you, prior you can't career. really make him. You can't make him like the, the romantic lead of <laughs> of some drama or something terribly easily. No, but uh, like the, uh, actually, I can't remember the name of it. They're about to release a second one where he ends up. He he plays this like softy guy, but he's essentially a, a hitman or something who's trying to get out of the business, and he develops mm. a relationship with a little girl, and and, and so it becomes this uh, kind of buddy picture where where he also has to be the protector and he was really cute and adorable in it and it was fantastic i like that there's going to be a sequel to it i have to dig into that a little bit more to oh find out what yeah you nice very cool uh, i'll no, find I out what that, that is and pass that along <laughs> yeah please do because I, I think he would be watching him and the way he treats jodie foster's character the way he treats the nurse he he does take on a very affectionate and caring uh, like he's caring for um, caring for a sick friend or, or you know his uh, his favorite aunt or something like that and he does it so well actually since we had talked at the top of the show about the, the dune stuff he was in the more current dunes uh, as the character Raban from the Harkonnens okay. and actually the comparison between the 80s and the current stuff he gave presence to a character that was just kind of a throwaway from the 80s film. I didn't really read the credits before the film started. I love the fact that Wolf King ends up being Jeff Goldblum. Yes. <laughs> and he is rather subdued for Jeff Goldblum. Oh, yeah. And he's brilliant in this as the bad guy. How many times have you seen Jeff Goldblum as an actual, like, I'm an evil MF and... <laughs> yeah, like he's evil and he means to be it. Yes. It's not yeah. like in The Fly where he becomes the monster. 
In this case, he's a monster flat out. He owns that he's a monster. He knows who he is. The scenes about him and the nurse and what he knows he's done to her. <laughs> yeah. And his kind of, I'm good with this. It, it, it caused this circle that allows for this place to exist. And yeah, that's just how it is. <laughs> oh, and his attitude with his son. Because uh, I was really digging it. Well, one, it's always fun to see Zachary Quinto show up in the, something. And for mm-hmm. to make him this like whiny little mob guy was <laughs> was kind of fun. But then the way Goldblum plays off of him, where he's just this, this sickeningly, like, despite the fact that he's a mobster and obviously a killer, all he wants is daddy's approval. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and daddy ain't giving it. And he is hardcore about it. I was like, I am dying and you're still a punk. <laughs> Didn't matter. I love that. No, it was fantastic. I, I I loved it. The the whole cast I think did a fantastic job. Uh, I wasn't terribly familiar with Sterling K. Brown. Uh, I I've looked him up since then and, and see that he's been in, in a lot of different films and a couple of the films I've actually seen. Yeah. But I have to admit it it wasn't anything that it wasn't like oh yeah Sterling Brown I know him. No, I, I, he's one that I'd like to see more from too because. I have seen him in a ton of stuff. He, he he winds up in lots of things that I watch, but he's he's in that character actor uh, mode, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think he has a presence. I, I'd love to see him do some lead stuff. Actually, yeah, take the take the front of the film more often. Uh huh. Yeah, like he was supposed to be part of the front of this film, but I mean, Jodie Foster was the primary character. I could watch a movie where he is just straight up the the character we're watching. Uh, Sophia Botella, I had to look her up. I, she was it was bugging me because I'm like <laughs> I know, I you've know seen her I've a seen thousand her. times. Yes, I what have I seen her in? And yeah, then I looked her up and then I were like, I think the one that really jog, uh, jostled my memory was uh, Kingsman. Kingsman, yeah. But I think I, I've seen her in a, in a few other things as well. She's got a really unique look about her. So that's why you see her, she sticks in your brain. To, to say that I find her attractive would be an understatement. But, uh, <laughs> um, and the fact that she's kind of kicked ass in the process doesn't hurt either. Uh, but no, I, I, she's another one though, but because she is attractive and she is capable of doing those kind of uh, movements to look like, she may actually know how to fight legit. I, I believe mm-hmm. she does a bit of her own stunt work. Uh, but all that said, I'd actually like to see a little bit more of her just being her, uh, cause she gets hired for lots of roles to be the badass chick, but I think there's more there. I'd like to see it. No, I, I'd be willing to, to, to watch her actually be something other than just, the uh, the assassin or the, uh, well, the assassin. That's what I've seen her most at. <laughs> Oh, and now that I've pulled up a little filmography, I assume she's a dancer by trade because she shows up as a dancer in a lot of stuff, mostly music videos. Um, yeah, most likely then. I also, I, I thought I recognized uh, this Jenny Slate. Yes, I love Jenny Slate. But weirdly, I, I looked through a lot of her filmography and I realized that she's done probably more voice work uh, than she has anything. She has, and, and she's also a stand-up comedian. Oh, interesting. Maybe I've seen clips of her doing that. Yes, no. She, in fact, she's had a special recently come out. Interesting. I maybe that's where I've seen her because yeah, I'm looking at all her filmography right now, and it's like, oh no, voice work, voice work, voice she's work, done a voice, lot work. Of voice work. Yeah, Hotel Artemis and Venom, voice work, <laughs> voice work. <laughs> I know I don't remember her from Venom. <laughs> no, and I've heard her in interviews and such actually uh it's mostly because you don't remember venom uh, exactly <laughs> she was actually one of the lead scientists in that movie <laughs> there i yeah i'll take your word for yep. it that there were scientists yeah yep. no at, at any rate uh but yeah no um having uh listened to her in interview and all that uh voice work uh fits her personality better <laughs> um 
Okay. Yeah, uh, she struggles with the world at times. So gotcha. So anytime where she can do work behind a microphone and nothing else, right up her alley. And she does gotcha. great work, voice work. She can make all sorts of crazy voices. As a film, you, you know, I mean, you said you saw it in the theater. Mm-hmm. I'll admit this is a film I only knew about because it kept popping up on streaming. Okay. I honestly didn't know it saw a theater release at all. It, this was a fairly, to me anyway, a quiet release. Yeah, like I said, the only reason I knew anything about it and why I went to see it is uh, comparisons that were made with John Wick at the time. Yeah, and I could definitely see, even if it weren't um, with a similar theme, mm-hmm. I, I think I could see where you could... Uh, make a connection sure. uh, and, and and maybe it's only because it's an action film and it's the type of action film because you're you're talking about you know criminals and you know, people that apparently can take hit after hit after hit from things that would kill any normal person <laughs> right. and still get up and fight back <laughs> yeah like like uh lev should have or whatever his uh actual name was honolulu from his room room assignment but there's no way he should have even made it to the hotel. <laughs> right. <laughs> he got shot a lot. <laughs> I actually found it a little a little annoying that we see um, Waikiki uh, Sherman, you know, when they're at the bike heist, and then boom, he takes like three rounds at the back, and he doesn't even blink, and he drags his brother off and everything, and you're like, what the hell? And it's it's probably an hour later in the film where he points out, oh, no, this is Kevlar. Well, thank you. (laughs) And and I think that's where some of the the John Wick vibe came in, too, is this man essentially owns normal-looking clothing that's bulletproof. Uh, And that was one of the whole points in John Wick. If you were of assassin level at a certain amount with enough money to do it, you can buy whole suits that are completely bulletproof. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so uh, you really are trying to this to, to be have a lot of parallels, and it's weirding me out. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but yeah, I was just I saw that, and then he doesn't react, and you go through most of this film, and I'm thinking, is no one going to mention the three bullet holes in the bat in this guy's back? <laughs> That's because the nurse isn't going to say anything, <laughs> nothing. And yeah, it, it's well into the film that. He takes another couple hits, and someone said something. He's like, oh, no, this is Kevlar. They, they could have brought that up a little sooner. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> Especially since he went out of his way to literally turn his back to the cops that were shooting at him and his brother. And you watch him take the hits, but they aren't. there's no reference. You don't see what happens. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do believe there is some uh, errors in the film, too, uh, continuity errors, because I'm pretty sure you see his back later in the film, and there's no holes in his vest. Yeah. <laughs> so... Maybe even more confused. Is he an android? I mean, we're in the future. Right. Uh, <laughs> I think maybe the vest is Kevlar, too. Well, yeah, that's the whole point. He was just wearing his vest when he got, I, I think, when he uh, took the hits. And then yeah. later in the film, there's no holes in his vest. I'm, so I'm like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> it's very good, Kevlar. There was no penetration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. They just bounced off. Very, I'm that, trying to help you out here, man. Work with me. <laughs> uh, no, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, if I had to maybe, if I had to look at it and like say, looking for things to to knock points off for it, I do think something like while the character of Acapulco and his interactions with Nice were fine, I don't know if he really brought a whole much else to the film other than kind of um derailing things when suddenly we kept cutting to him on the roof waiting for his helicopter and then that doesn't happen because something else happens and it's like do we really need this character i think he was supposed to be there for comic relief but did not provide enough of it to make him worthwhile to even exist his Mm -hmm. story brought nothing It, it had no consequence over any of the other things that happened so yeah, for that he, he's kind of fluff. I guess you, on that same point, you could question whether you needed the uh, the nurse and the, her uh, you know the the friend of her of her deceased child who turned out to be a police officer at the door of the Artemis. 
by the saying argument, you're like, what did this really bring other than you gave Nurse a little bit more humanity, maybe? Well, we wanted to bring up more of the uh, the story about her and her son, and this was supposed to be a connection to it, but it was such an awkward connection. Mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't even entirely clear, uh, especially since she apologized, told her how she felt bad about what happened to her son. But you get the sense that they were like little kid friends, not not like adult friends. Yeah, you couldn't quite it, place when it was all supposed to happen. What happened to her son? When was it? Because in her her memories that she kept flashing back to, he was a little boy. Uh huh. Yeah. But he supposedly <clears throat> died of a drug overdose and. The body that you see in the surf looked like a young adult. Yeah, twenty something. Yeah, and then you you work in the uh, the character of uh, of of Morgan, and yeah, so is a childhood friend. Were they were they boyfriend girlfriend? Uh, yeah, it's a little hard to kind of piece that together. Well, and, and then to make the connection back, like okay. It's a childhood friend of her son, whatever the state of that friendship might have been. How does she know where she is? Mm-hmm. Like, it didn't seem like it was an ongoing connection. This was a thing from the past. So how does this woman know where to find her? <laughs> yeah, was this luck? Was this was this a sort of a... Uh... That thing that that secret that everybody knows is that what the Artemis is, and is that what the nurse is? And, and, and that's probably leads into at least one of the things that was always a little off putting for me. I I appreciate that they were trying to set a tone that uh, we're in an L.A. in a water crisis, things are not going well. Um, Lord only knows what the rest of the U.S. is like in this world. Obviously, crime just go, it runs rampant. So, and given that this is 2028 and that's four years from now, I'm really hoping that we're not foreshadowing here. Uh, but at any rate, uh, while they're setting up this world, kind of not sure how all of this kind of all fits together. Like, the Morgan character is also a cop that kind of knows this woman from... A while ago I get that she might know if it's just it's the secret that everybody knows the hotel what the hotel Artemis is for God's sake it's got a giant sign in the sky <laughs> <laughs> somebody's gonna ask so what's the hotel Artemis what's it like to stay there stuff like that you'd think it'd come up anyway <laughs> but so since she's a cop in this world and probably knows what that building is even though you're not Supposed to. There's no reason to know why she would think her person is in that building. And, and we needed a little bit more. They made this world. And again, I don't need to be beaten over the head, but you got to give me a little bit more if you're going to want to tie the characters to all of this. Yeah, because didn't it come up at some point that it had been uh, like many years since the nurse had been outside. Yeah. I thought it was like a big number too. Yeah, no, it was, she said something like 14 years or something crazy like that. Right. And, and, and uh, the orderly actually went lower and it was actually way, almost double what he said. So, yeah, yeah. So she's been there a long time and I get maybe that some in the, the know, but since she just goes by the nurse, I actually kind of dug that they, the way that this place works is anonymity is key. So you go by monikers, not not actual names. Um, but yeah, because everyone would just know her as the nurse, the other guy is the orderly. Why would this cop know who she is in, in that building? Right. It, yeah, it I, I, I thought it was going to lead to something else. Right. You know, was this some sort of infiltration? Was this some sort of plant? Was this part of some plot? And no, it's, I'm injured, I healed you, Everest will get you outside, and that's the end. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, other than a little emotional exchange, 
in this case, she's a plot device. She's there mm-hmm. to really rile up the nurse so that when King, the Wolf King shows up, she's in a more heightened state uh, for how she's going to deal with him. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. So it, it's a clumsy plot device, but that's all it is. She, right. she, she could have... She's the MacGuffin. <laughs> Technology-wise in this 2028, um, holograms become a really big thing in the next four years, apparently. Well, and you can actually find them in some of the silliest of places already. So so that as far as tech and having it involved it more in your life, that makes sense. I, I'd say they were pretty close. Yeah, and I don't think they made any real leaps with the uh, robotic surgery or the 3D printed organs or anything. That's all something that has been developed and, and been been a thing for some time yeah, now. Yeah, and in various states of actually being functional. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know if it's uh, yet to the point where you can throw someone down on a table and a computer and go, ah, here's the problem and start working on him. Right. <laughs> But no, but that that is a goal, and it may not be as far off as we think. And uh, robotic surgery is already a thing. So, yeah, uh, they, I, I don't think they made a stretch. I always find it funny, though, when a movie only sets their future out like a, a decade from the time of its release. That's kind of tricky. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's almost trickier than the ones that go way the hell out there. At least Star Trek, you're like... None of us that are watching this will ever be alive when that comes out, so we can't really pick on it that way. So that makes sense. But when it's 10 years out, you're like, wow, you could make some things that just make just not right. <laughs> yeah. It, it takes you too far out of what you're trying to watch. Until I can uh, hold my little communication device that has the floating hologram uh, digits and, and pictures or people's heads floating in front of it, you know, Um well, it's and, all going to seem a little, uh, little uh, fantastical. And, and, and part of that uh, whole, uh, de- that w- at least the one of the devices involves the implant in the eye. Yes, uh, yeah, a camera installed in her eye. She's got a bionic eye. Yes. So uh, again, not far out of conceivability. Probably not in the next four years. But no, no, I don't think so. Although, with what they probably make to do the things that they do, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I did throw this out to social media. I did not really get any comments on it. Uh, other than uh, uh, Matt, he, who said, I, oh, I wanted to see this when it came out, and I still haven't gotten around to it. And he said I should fix that. So <laughs> <laughs> He's in your camp. <laughs> he was in my camp, absolutely. Uh but what did the critics of the time have to say about this thing? Oh yeah, and this is a this will be a fun ride too. So, uh, and of course, the higher end, uh, we start with San Francisco Chronicle Mick LaSalle. As a first-time director, Pierce manages something difficult. He creates a tone that acknowledges absurdity, but also consequences. He finds an edge. That's extreme, that's weird, that's satirical, and that goes right to the edge of farce, and yet the movie is, at, at all points, as involving as an intense drama. High, a fairly high praise of... I, I didn't realize this was a first-time director venture No, either. I didn't realize that either, but... Uh, it, considering how many first-timers we, we've talked about in the past... This is a solid entry for a first timer. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, even if you have issues with the film, it's this is a good attempt. Well, he he did the smart thing by giving himself a really great cast that he probably didn't have to direct all that much. <laughs> uh, and we'll start getting some vibes on that. Lots of critics were kind of like, "Why did Jody Foster oh. do this film?" Oh, interesting. Yes, okay, it's very Con- interesting. Continue on then. Uh, a variety. Peter DeBurge, uh, Hotel Artemis has the elegant simplicity of a quality B movie wrapped up in a self-consciously and somewhat overcompensatingly cool piece of genre entertainment. It boasts snappy dialogue, memorable characters, and a gorgeously designed central location but doesn't quite know what to do with any of the above. Acknowledging its coolness, 
not really feeling all the pieces coming together. Mm, okay, interesting. Uh, and then uh, on RogerEbert.com, uh, Peter Sabinski, I believe is how that's pronounced. Um, Hotel Artemis is based around a plot conceit so similar to one in the action hit John Wick that some may see the film as part of an extended John Wick universe. And I think that's where I got that vibe from. Uh, yeah. Rest assured, to describe it merely as a knockoff of that movie is to do it a bit of disservice because it borrows from a number of different sources, ranging from The Purge to large hunks of the filmography of John Carpenter and Walter Hill. Oddly enough, uh, oh, too oddly enough, The Grand Hotel. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, I'm not sure I've seen, I know what he's talking about there. While originality may not exactly be a great be in great supply here these familiar elements have been mixed with enough wit and style to make for some sleazy insanely violent and reasonably entertaining b-movie trash <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry was that a good or bad review because yeah. <laughs> it was that makes me want to watch it again from, from the site <laughs> so it's a solidly in the middle they basically yeah, he enjoyed it for what it was um yeah and, and fits it more in that b movie category but you know a lot of critics will automatically put any uh, action intense film um or genre kind of feel already in the b category without any reason for doing so and now to really just lay it out <laughs> From the Observer, Rex Reed. There are bad movies everywhere, and then there is 97 minutes of total garbage called Hotel Artemis. This shoddle, shoddy, gross, cruel, and nauseating freak show is the work of Drew Pierce, a writer of no discernible talent. He, he throws in Iron Man 3 and Mission Impossible Rogue Nation as examples. Uh, making an atrocious directing debut. Moronic drivel that truly qualifies as the worst movie of the year. It sinks amateurish movie making aimed at audiences with no taste to an alarming new low. Wow. Yes. That sounds like he had like an axe to grind. <laughs> that wasn't like a review of a movie. That was... It, yeah, did, it would. Did that guy cut him off in traffic? Yeah, or? like th this was a drive-by. I mean, he just yeah, taking them out. I, I, I actually kind of wonder if Drew Pierce owes him money, but uh -huh. <laughs> that was unnecessarily harsh, and I can't agree with it at all. Um, no, no. I'm like, I don't know what you're watching, and if you go to films, I don't know what you're looking for in film, because <laughs> I'm like. This was a highly entertaining film. Uh, it, is it perfect? No. Um, it is it a bit. Uh, I will still own that it is a lot rushed at the end. By the time we get to the climax, it's done in five minutes, and we're at credits. They're like, mm -hmm. oh my god! <laughs> and everybody kind of comes to whatever their conclusion very quickly. So, um, at any rate, uh, yeah, it doesn't deserve any of that. But this is. I actually found it, it became better for me the second time than the first. Yeah, awesome. No, I, I liked it fine. I'm. It's not going to go into, like, my, my list of favorite action films that I've seen or anything, yeah. but I certainly didn't sit there and walk away from it like this this last critic and, and want to go beat someone up over it. I mean... <laughs> this would do well in the era of cable. Like, if it was just running on a TBS, I'd happily just... Oh, okay, that's what's on for the next hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's exactly what this is. Maybe this isn't the film that people are going to click on the watch because they see it on the streaming service because, like I said, it's been on... <laughs> I've, I've thought about and but never started it. But if it were already on, you saw it and you're flipping from channel to channel kind of thing, 
oh, I'll stop and watch this for a little bit. It has, to this date, uh, uh, one of the coolest lines, and it got Dave Batista got to deliver it. And, and I meant to write it down in its entirety, but basically the gist of it is, if you don't stop jumping on my back, I am going to make you extremely unhealthy. And, <laughs> and he delivered that line after mentioning that he was a healthcare worker. Yes. <laughs> and I actually found myself, I hadn't quite heard that in the, in the first viewing of it in the theater and latched onto it, but it hit me this time and I just started busting out laughing. I loved it. Yeah. No, the, if nothing else, there is a few just scattered throughout the film. There is some fantastic line deliveries from several of the characters at different times. So here I, I cause I got curious and while I, I was looking through the quotes on IMDB, uh, feel free to leap accordingly, but Everest actually says, I will unheal the shit out of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's awesome. <laughs> Even his introduction, uh, the nurse comes up and you know, here's my orderly. His name Everest. I think you know why, <laughs> or I think you can see why. Yeah. Oh, I, even while I'm scrolling through here, actually, one of the ones that was between Jodie Foster and uh, and uh, what's his name, the <laughs> Wolf King. Gold, Goldblum, Jeff Goldblum. Anyway, I can't believe I lost his name there for a second. Anyways, she at one point says, you killed my son. And he responds, you made a deal with the devil. What did you expect? <laughs> like, and, and how creepy and, and just, I know who I am. Screw the world. <laughs> kind, yeah, kind of yeah, vibe he, that he gave that. Was made no excuses for the type of person he was. No, the delivery I, it was so good. This cast, it, uh, yeah, if, it, if any of the imperfections that this film might have, the cast makes it worth the watch, no matter what. Well, that will do it for Hotel Artemis. Uh, in two weeks, we are going to check out Johnny Mnemonic from 1995. Another one on my watch list have not seen it yet looking forward to it wow i i I still struggle that you hadn't caught this one yet again i don't know why because i go back and watch the same crap (laughs) (laughs) yes folks he watches the same the same films that we review is all that he ever watches (laughs) (laughs) no i go back and watch films that I've seen a dozen times before instead of watching anything new I I, I'll, I admit I have that problem no no no, no. I get it. It, it it's the grilled cheese and tomato soup versus the fusion cuisine <laughs> yeah yeah it's exactly it and it depends you know a lot of times my uh my movie watching time is usually after 9 p.m. and so I gotta pick and choose like okay if I'm gonna fall asleep in front of something <laughs> You want to fall asleep from something you've seen already so you don't worry about it so much. Yes, exactly. (laughs) I feel you. I got you. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, As always, if you've seen uh, Johnny Mnemonic or if you've seen Hotel Artemis, uh, drop us a line, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com or come to any of the social media sites and leave some comments there. Uh, Join our Facebook group. Uh, That's always a really great place to, uh, to leave a comment. Uh, Tom, as always, thank you very much. This was the one that I think uh, you probably brought to the list more than anything. Yep. You, you had seen it. So I, I'm very thankful that you have. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. Yep, it was good fun. We'll be back in a couple weeks, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. Bye. See ya.